Hey everyone, welcome to another episode of the DLC Drop Podcast. Today, it's my pleasure to welcome my very good friend, Vinny Minicello. Vinny is somebody who I just love geeking out on esports and business with. Uh, we've had many conversations about the agency side, the brand side, and the production side, and excited to bring one of those conversations to you today. Let's talk to Vinny. Drop in the untold stories of industry leaders, influencers, and insights on future innovation. I'm John Davidson, and this is the DLC, DLC Drop, Drop Podcast. Podcast. All right, welcome to another episode of the DLC Drop Podcast. It is my pleasure to welcome one of my favorite people, not just in this world, but specifically in the esports space. I think I said that backwards. Uh, Vinny Minicello, hailing from, you're in New York today, is that right? I am, yeah, back in my hometown, upstate Elmira, New York. Awesome. Well, to give a little background for the audience, uh, you and I have been connected not a super duper long time, but I think our friendship is more quality over quantity. And I remember, I, I want to say it was like during COVID, I think you had slid, you know, slid into my DMs on Twitter and you sent me something and I was just so busy at the time. You know, I think I kind of saw it and overlooked it. And then one of our good friends, Chris Mann, who I think mm-hmm. is one of the smartest guys in the esports space, he said, dude, you should really connect with this guy, Vinny. And I was like, oh, that guy messaged me on Twitter. I never got back to him. Holy crap. And so you were gracious enough uh, to not cancel me after it took me too long to to respond. But one of the things we have conversations all the time we get in really deep on our perspectives on the space, what's working, what's not. And I think that you are one of the bright young minds in the industry. And so I'm just excited to highlight you, excited to have this conversation in front of everybody um, rather than the private conversations we have on a regular basis. Oh, well, that means the world, man. I, thank you for that. Uh, I do remember that day and I do remember sending you uh, I think it was like an essay. I think I was just, I think I was in my, I think I was just brainstorming and ended up writing like pages and pages of uh, how I was interpreting the video game industry during COVID. Um, yeah. And, and I didn't have anybody to react to it. I didn't know who to send it to. And um, I was always fascinated by the way that you kind of approach the space and, and kind of your insights. And so, um, I was like, Hey, I'm going to hit the stranger up and see if he wants to read my essay. So, uh, <laughs> I don't, I don't blame you for not reading it whatsoever, but, uh, I'm glad that, that you, that you circled back on it. Cause, uh, I, I have to echo your sentiment of, uh, the conversations that we, that you and I have, you know, usually, uh, you know, off camera and just kind of candidly, uh, I think we chatted for like two hours yesterday while I was driving. Right. Um, right. Uh, those conversations are, uh, more valuable than than I realized at the time, you know, when we're talking about it, because, uh, you know, I do have these, when we get off the phone, you know, my brain is still kind of stewing and still kind of spinning. And, um, you know, any type of thought provoking convo that I can have like that, you know, I, I, I welcome it. So uh, I, I really appreciate uh, your brain and the way that you approach things. And so uh, I can't, I'm stoked to even be invited onto this thing here, but Well, I appreciate it. So, um, you know, typically on this podcast, uh, we interview industry leaders, and these are people who are CEOs, uh, CROs, CCOs, people who've been in business for a very long time. And I'm typically not me, but (laughs) I'm typically saying, "Hey, you've done this for 20 years. You're this, you know, have this amazing career path. Let's go through it. Let's share these insights." But I think it's just as important to highlight the people who are the here and now, who are the bright young minds. And I see you as one of these people. Uh, Go ahead and share your relatively brief history, but share what your history in the esports space has been uh, to this point. Sure. Um, Well, I guess I'll have to go before the esports space. And, uh, you know, I actually started, I cut my teeth in the work in in industry in general from sports. Um, I was a sport management major at Ithaca College. And I played baseball for a few years there. So in my brain, the only logical move was to, you know, head into the sports world Um, as a lowly salesman. You know, I was working for the uh, Arizona Coyotes and then the uh, Washington Wizards and Capitals Mm. uh, for about three years, just making about 150 phone calls a day, selling season tickets, uh, getting hung up on, you know, just, just going through the motions, learning how to 
take a rejection, learning how, you know, I, I look at it now as like that kind of established my work ethic. And, um, yeah. you know, my advisor had told me that anything, you know, get the, get the, the hard job out of the way. Cause anything that you do after that, uh, mm-hmm. will look easy. And then you can kind of start to qualify and quantify the experiences as you, as you age. Good advice. Yeah. Um, and, and yeah, so that essentially I, you know, I was on this, I was knee deep in sales. I was this quintessential sales guy, uh, you know, suit and tie with a briefcase, taking the DC Metro every day, like, um, you know, and, and eventually started to look into the partnership marketing side of things on sports and started to kind of be fascinated on these brand deals. And uh, my mind was kind of starting to, to entertain the thought of, uh, that side of the industry. Yeah. And, um, but, but I'd been kind of soured by it, uh, by looking at kind of the opportunities that were in sports. I know that kind of sounds uh, like a negative, but, uh, I just had a hard time. Like, like the only thing I was able to really offer my, my partners was like a, a table on the concourse or like their, their logo on the jumbotron, right? Like yeah. I wasn't, I wasn't like, I wasn't getting fulfilled by like shaking these guys and like staring, like staring them in the eyes and saying, this is good value that I can bring you. Um, yeah. It's like I got ribbons that, in the arena, led ribbons. Cool. Right. Yeah. Like what is, how does that hit their objectives? And, and uh, yeah, long story short, I took that passion. I took that, like the, the idea that, you know, I have to believe in my product. I have to, in order for me to be successful in any career or anything that I do, like, it first comes with, you know, believing in the product or believing in the company that you're with. Um, and at the time, and obviously still remains true to this day, the one industry that is always looked at as kind of the, the success factor of, of kind of bringing in this new age millennial audience has always been gaming yeah. um, and esports. And uh, I didn't really know how to get my foot in the door, didn't really know how to get a job. Uh, so I just started posting on LinkedIn and I just started networking with folks um, and then landed a coordinator role at an agency in D.C. Uh-huh. Um, called Red Peg. And those guys actually, you know, I'll never, you know, both the CEO and the president, Brad Nirenberg and John Peaster, both went to Ithaca College, which is where I went, obviously. And so, yeah, uh, it just kind of happenstance and, you know, uh, you know, it, it all worked out where uh, I ended up joining their team as a coordinator. But on the esports kind of side of things, they, they did a lot of cool things with Geico. Um, yeah. They were really looking to expand their efforts with Geico in the gaming space and um, right place, right time. I ended up kind of just picking up and learning the ropes and then ended up running the Geico gaming program for about two and a half years there at Red Peg and, and along throughout that, uh, you know, pitching and winning and, and executing other brands, um, mostly non-endemic brands, you know, uh-huh. like AT&T, um, and we did a few things with Amazon as well, but, uh, and then, uh, Niantic Pokemon go, um, we were fortunate enough to, to land them as a client to do all of the go fest events and even cool. the Harry Potter wizard unite events. So, um, I guess I'm saying all that to say, like, I, I kind of tried to wear a handful of different hats. I kind of wanted to learn a lot about sales. I, I wanted to get inundated in the marketing world. I felt an obligation to learn about the production side of things. Um, Mm -hmm. because from a sales and marketing aspect, you need to know what things cost. You need to know how realistic things are so that, you know, that you're not over promising and under delivering essentially. Right. right? So, um, that took, I, I hoped I I took all that experience and all of that and everything that I had learned and, and, you know, tried to put my, put my next step forward and my best foot forward. And I left my friends and family and I moved to Seattle and I joined a production company because that was the that was the next step in my career to like really round out my skill set. Yeah. Um, and I did that in February of 2020, right when COVID started. So, um, that was a, a big familiar. change and, a, and yeah. a big hurdle to overcome. And, um, you know, obviously we pivoted everything digital and I learned all about the, the digital broadcasting and virtual events and, um, just kind of kept, kind of kept pushing on and, and learning as much as I could just being a sponge and, and kind of just, uh, with the back of my mind waiting for that next opportunity to come up. Like I, sure. I was really pumped at the work that I was doing, but I had deviated a little bit from the gaming space. I was yeah. more so in the, in the, in the hearts and the throes of production and, you know, selling leadership conferences and summits. And, um, while it was, I was learning a lot. I wasn't, I didn't feel fulfilled, right. I didn't move sure. all the way across the country to, to do, to get away from the gaming space. And, um, you know, but, but I kept going cause I, I had a job. I was fortunate. I had a great company. Uh, I had a great product. So I was still, I was still pumped. Um, but that 
finally came to a, uh, I think this was what, two and a half months ago, um, I ended up landing a job with the, this agency, the Omnicom, the Zero Code guys, uh, yeah. about, I think, two months ago. And now I have the opportunity to lead the Mountain Dew Game Fuel account um, and, wow. and basically run their all of their partners and lead their lead their program here as uh, on a year by year basis. And um, you know, I, uh, I I couldn't be more fortunate. I, you know, I've never. This is I feel like this is finally the lane that I need to be in, um, and I'm challenged every single day. It's it's overwhelming to not be the smartest guy in the room anymore. Um, <laughs> Sure. You know, I not not that I don't mean it, or the most informed uh, guy in the room, sort of a thing. Yeah, yeah, right. I guess that's a much better way to put it. Like, I, I guess I was always, I had always positioned myself to be the gamer guy in every yeah. room, so that I could be valuable to everybody. Right. And now that I'm the gamer guy in a room filled with gamers that know more than me, it was kind of like a, a little bit of a humbling experience. Um, but I, I, it was, it really, I, I welcome it with open arms. Like I am learning every single day. Um, and I, and I have incredible coworkers, I have great partners and, uh, I we do awesome work. So I am, I, I am like a pig in slop right now, man. Like I'm, I'm having so much fun and, um, you know, and, and I get to do uh, cool things and help potentially shape the industry and how brands are and how brands are making moves in the industry. And so, yeah. um, that kind of strokes the ego a little bit too, if I'm being honest, right? Like that's, sure. that, that's why we're here. We're here to make, we're here to make moves and, um, you know, and so I'm, I'm just, I'm just stoked that, that it all kind of came and, and I didn't think it was going to happen. So the DLC drop podcast is sponsored by ice shaker. I've been a huge fan of this brand for the past few years, ever since I met founder Chris Gronkowski. Uh, what I love about this product is the brand story, the functionality and the customization. Ice shaker is a shark tank company invested in by Mark Cuban and Alex Rodriguez owned by NFL players Rob Gronkowski and Chris Gronkowski. I love using my ice shaker anytime I'm driving to the podcast studio, I'm going skateboarding, or I'm at the gym. No matter what I'm doing, it just does a great job of keeping my drinks hot or cold. The customization for ice shaker is something that's super unique. You can get any name, just about any logo engraved onto your ice shaker and delivered to you within just three to five business days. Get your own DLC drop branded ice shaker at icehaker.com forward slash DLC drop. Save 20% on all ice shaker products with the discount code DLC drop. Well, congratulations. Congratulations on that. I think they're in great hands. And so I'm hyped for both parties. You zero code. Mountain Dew Game Fuel. Um, what I want to get into here is a lot of your insights on uh, sponsorship and partnership in the esports space. Uh, we know that the esports space is extremely reliant on partnerships. And during mm-hmm. my time at GameStop and why I'm part of the Esports Trade Association was my recognition back then that the vast majority of revenues come from partnerships that partners are not receiving an ROI on whether that is because of the type of activation, their approach, the type of campaign, or the execution of the team that they are working with, and sometimes both. So what we see in the esports space is a much more skeptical consumer than traditional sports. In traditional sports, I always use this example. If you go to a Dallas Cowboys game at AT AT&T Stadium, Jerry World, there's a little blimp flying around. And it's an Albertsons blimp. It's a grocery store. And everybody's just like, cool, there's a little blimp. Albertsons, that's fun. Maybe I'll shop Mm -hmm. there sometime. If those football fans had the same perspective as esports enthusiasts, as as the term goes, they would say, the hell is Albertsons doing here? You don't have anything to do with football. What right do you have? And, you know... And so because of this increased skepticism, it requires a deeper deeper level of integration Mm -hmm. on the part of the brand. And there's just a lot of people who either don't know that, don't know what the the space wants, don't have the connections to get with great partners who are going to do a great job. And this is where you come in, my friend. So let's open it up. Let's start sharing some insights on, you know, how we can improve this together. Sure. Yeah, I mean, 
again, this is just from my brain, right? So it's of course. take it for the great assault. But, um, you know, I think what, what I've learned and, and everyone here says it, I think I've, I've listened to, uh, I don't know how many episodes of your, uh, of guests that have been featured that still, that all say the same things. It's all about, it's all about expectation setting with the brand ahead of time, right? Yeah. Like that's everyone, you know, and that's all well and good, but like at what point, when you set these expectations, obviously you're, you know, if you set them too low, like then they're obviously not going to want to do anything. And, yeah. um, and so you still have to dangle that carrot in some, in some facet. Right. And, um, I think what, what I've tried to land on is, is this model of, um, it's a three stage. I think I look at it as a three tiered approach for any brand, whether they're endemic or non endemic, okay. uh, there's three stages that, that need to happen in order for you to start receiving, a return on your investment. And I look at it from uh, step one is be known. Step two is be understood. And step three is be loved. Now mm. you get your returns when you're loved, but you can't be loved without being understood. And you can't be understood without being known. Yeah. So uh, we see it all the time where like these brands will come in and make this splash and they'll dump a million dollars prize pool on a tournament or they'll like, and they just, they, they try to be loved right away. And yep. they get this negative reaction from from everybody else. Whereas, well, this is what uh, I would you, say. I would I would just correct you slightly. I would say maybe they assume they are loved already because okay. they sure. are loved in other industries. You might say like a Coke or somebody like this. They recently yeah. had a spot that I wrote an article about, um, and it was replicating these famous Coca Cola spots that they've mm-hmm. had where they're holding hands and they're dancing around the earth and all these things, the polar bears, you know, like everybody yeah. knows these spots and they did one that was adapted to esports, and it was a miss for a lot of reasons. But that was an assumption of you love me. And so I'm going to take that love and insert it yeah. in this world. And it's like, no, 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 bro. We've been doing this for 20 years. You just showed up. I need you to show me you're here for the right reasons. I couldn't agree more. And I think that that is, I think the first step is, is when you're, when you're introducing your, your brand, you know, the be known aspect um, is honestly a, like an awareness play. It's a small, it's like, a, right. Hey, here we are. We're here to learn about you guys. We're here to gather data. We're here to address pain points. We want you guys to know that we are looking at the space to support you guys and to not exploit you guys, but really John, like that's it. Like there, I don't think that there should be this monumental first step. Now, now I do think that once you do have this awareness play established, now that is that that can come from something like um, sponsoring a couple of influencers, maybe grabbing a team, you know, doing something with a team. Like you could do these smaller steps and just kind of getting a feel for the industry and the community. Sure. Once you kind of lay that net out and you have this, like, okay, now that people know who we are. Now that you can start to drive whatever your message is, you yeah. can start to drive. And that's your, that's you being understood. Now, whatever your message is, whether you are here to address pain points, whether you are here to uplift the community, whatever, whatever the brand uncovers from their being known kind yeah. of play, uh, they can then address all those pain points and be understood as a brand that's here to help. So um, I, I heard something really important there. Um, or you said what they learn from their awareness play. And so I think it's important to listen to the community and adjust accordingly because a lot of times there's a tendency where, okay, I'm just, I'm I'm doing the talking, right? Mm -hmm. And you're just accepting me. But I always tell every brand if if the experiences of the community are not better as a result of your brand being part of it, you're not ready to be part of it yep. because that's how you're accepted. Yep. And so what you're saying, if I'm getting this right, is through this awareness, learn what are the pain points or the experiential enhancement opportunities that are in line with your brand story. Yeah. Like don't, yeah. Don't come in assuming you know more than the gamers. Like Boom. that's, well said. I think that's, that's really what it, it boils down to. Like come in, like pretend you don't pretend you are, transplanted uh, from from like you know it, it's it, pretend like you have no pre- preconceived notion of the space or of gamers and sit there for three months and just learn um and you'll be surprised at what at things that you can take away from it 
Um, well, but, I, and, and I think it echoes the same point that you said earlier about the learning what the community wants. And I think that that's a huge, we're also seeing that as a, as a big miss in my opinion of like this, if you build it, they will come mentality. We're like, mm-hmm. Hey, we're just going to announce a tournament. We're going to put a hundred thousand dollar prize pool there. We're going to do it in, in, in Miami, Florida, and we're going to sell 10,000 tickets. Well, did anybody ask for that? Like, did, like, Good what, question. If, what about, what about spending a year cultivating a community to the point where then they are the ones clamoring for the event where they're like, Hey, game fuel, like, where's our event? Like, give us, give us our event. Like, like we're like, you've been doing all this stuff. Like we, we we're here now we're dying for one rather than being like, yeah. Hey, we're doing an event. Let's hope to see if we can pull some bells and whistles to get people to show up. Like now you already have an audience and a community that, that is craving an experience that now that you can just, then you get to pop it down and, and, and let everybody have fun, you know? Yeah, and that that goes to another point that we were discussing yesterday is there is this model of sponsorship that is easy and obvious, which is why every brand seems to do it, but we don't believe it's particularly effective. And it's the it's the typical brand sponsor tournament model. And if you are a brand, a non-endemic specifically, who doesn't know a lot about esports, okay, you're like, okay, there's a lot of eyeballs in the space. How do I get in front of the eyeballs? And then you have a number of companies, we won't name them, and I'm not saying anything critical here of them, but there's a lot of companies that produce tournaments who say you can sponsor the tournament, and it's kind of just a plug and play. Now, what we were discussing yesterday is, (sighs) it's a little bit of a tired approach, and it doesn't appear to be particularly useful. And also, what is your next step after you sponsor the tournament? Right, you're just going to put your name on a bunch of tournaments and hope people buy whatever's in that bag. <laughs> no, I, what are your I, thoughts on it that? Is, yeah, I. It, it's a double-edged sword, right? Like I, I think that that the tournament, that the sponsored tournament model, um, is so easily replicated. It's it can be done digitally, and it it justifies every it checks every box from a viewership standpoint Mm -hmm. um and i also have to be careful because i'm doing three sponsored tournaments this week (laughs) so uh like i you know it's it's almost like a practice what you preach but i would also say i'm not saying don't sponsor tournaments i think what we're saying is so many brands only sponsor tournaments yeah it is what that it is what is that next step um and and i think that that's a really great you know, anybody can sponsor a tournament. I'm, I'm of the mindset that, that while they do have their place and they do have their value, like we've been seeing the same hamster wheel of sponsored tournaments for like the last two years or so. Um, and again, COVID, yeah, all limits, that stuff comes to things. play, but there hasn't been this, this evolution of the space, um, that, you know, that, 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 that is maybe, that anyone's waiting on um or this is the evolution of the space but now we're looking now we need to figure out now that maybe the world kind of turning back around and communities are starting to you know populate up in in local markets and whatnot like is there an evolution of what that looks like um but but i agree and i'm not telling you that the answer is to pivot to content like i'm not telling you the answer is to pivot to influencers and streamers like uh, I don't, there is not one cookie cutter model that is going to, is going to work, but, um, and, and, you know, I hate the, I hate that idea of like telling everybody they need to diversify across their esports portfolio. Right. But, sure. uh, it is a, it is a test and learn. Um, you can't put all your eggs in one basket and, and sure if the more tournaments you do, the more your brand is going to fall in love with that repetition and that cycle and it's going to be harder to break and harder to do innovative things that that you know because they're just going to be they're like well is that going to get us forty thousand viewers you know is that going to do this 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 and this and it's like well no but it's going to help move the space it's going to help enrich the community that you guys are building like it's going to help you know this 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 and this but your initial point can you quantify that can can you you know does that are we proving that or are we just aspirationally thinking that you know, our brand has this ego that, that we're helping, you know, enrich these lives of gamers and whatnot. So, 
Yeah. It's difficult for sure. Well, and, you know, we're not going to have every answer, but I'd love to provide some answers uh, to the audience because I, I, I'm i a big believer that, uh, you know, don't poke holes if you have nothing to fill it with. And, mm-hmm. you know, there one. So one thing that I would point out and we can kind of like workshop this as we go. But one of the things I'm a firm believer in is that a brand's approach has to be custom. It's a one off. And yeah. so there's the over we're overused word of authenticity of course we always talk about but there's kind of a a common sense test here where if your brand is doing x in the space if i hear let's say uh yeah chipotle is doing this you're like cool yeah that sounds about right you know Mm -hmm. and i think what it is is it's partnering first going to the community and saying what do you need and what do you want Because you made the point very well. Don't go to people and say, we're here and this is what you want. You say, how can I help? And then you take those variety of needs and some of those are going to make sense for your brand to satisfy and some will not make sense for your brand to satisfy based on what your brand is, what that journey is, etc. And so you take, let's say, two alcohol brands, right? Let's say Paps Blue Ribbon and Bud Light. They're in the same category. The right approaches for those brands are extremely different because they mm-hmm. have such different positioning in the market. Yeah. I right. Mean, we are we are facing that brand struggle uh, actually from a from a from a Mountain Dew slash Game Fuel perspective. Um, yeah. They they are both obviously like you said energy drinks. Their Mountain Dew is the parent company that competes with their sub company. So their green do is technically a competitor to their game fuel product. That's line, interesting. Right? So there yeah. is a, there's an interesting dynamic. And, and again, whether or not they actually are competitors or not is a different story, but everyone's vying for shelf space at retail stores. Right. And the energy sure. category is very difficult to get into, um, to, to get shelf space there. So, uh, there, there is some, there is some kind of cannibalism that goes on there. Um, but again, it's how do we, how do how do we create a space for Mountain Dew and Game Fuel to live in the gaming space um, yeah. that doesn't bastardize each other, right? That doesn't that doesn't kind of uh, overlap with each other. Like, can we create these swim lanes that everybody knows that Mountain Dew is here for the gamers and Game Fuel is here for the esports competition, right? Like, is that in is that what we need to go down? Like, and so. You know, we do fight this battle of how customized can we really get? Like, should it just be a plug and play or or do we have to think of this innovative approach? Um, You know, I think my favorite quote that my old director told me was, um, you know, what got us here won't get us there. Right. So like everything that we're like, everything that we did with the brand to if we hit all these goals and we check all these boxes and we crush year one. If we do the same exact thing year two, we're gonna fail. Because mm. you know, it's it's it, we have to continue to evolve. You have to continue to iterate. You have to continue to learn, um, so that if you sign this three year deal, you're not just doing the same thing for three years in a row, right? You're learning from right. year one and applying it towards year two, and then learning from year two and apply and then and then hitting a home run year three, right? And yeah. so, um, and, and I don't know if. Uh, you know, it's just, it's, it's difficult. It's fun to say, and it's nice to think, but like when, in, you know, when pen comes to paper and, um, and there's approvals and corporate and brands and, you know, and there's a lot more, uh, red, you know, red tape to, to kind of finesse through, you yeah. start to realize why, why some of these partnerships are the way that they are. And then you start to be, and then, and now I'm even looking at some of these partnerships, but in a broader light where I'm like, wow, I can't believe they even got to do that. Right. Like that's impressive on its own. Sure. Right. And so, um, you know, it, it is all about, you know, there are brands that are more willing to, to test the waters with things. There are more brands that are willing to experiment. And then there's others that, um, you know, they just want their presence in the space and they want to treat the same way that they treat traditional sports. And, uh, and they want to call it a day. So, um, yeah. you know, there's there's different methods for everyone. Well, I think uh, one of the benefits of COVID from a marketing standpoint was to, you know, exactly what you're saying here is that brands are safe. They don't want to mm-hmm. try new things. Uh, I mean, it could cost somebody their job 
if they say, okay, I'm going to take a bet on this. I believe you. I'm going to try this innovative thing. You don't get that ROI. Those allocated marketing dollars were wasted and you lose your job, right? So uh, marketers typically want to do the same thing over and over and over and over again when the challenge is, is that the esports consumer demands more. And mm-hmm. so through COVID, one of the things that it was a benefit for marketers, which uh, it, it developed a comfort for digital advertising. Yeah. So I was talking to a lot of my agency friends during COVID and they were sharing that, you know, digital has always been viewed as an add-on or the nice to have, but don't really know that world. I, I, I want this other world I've known for the last 10 years. Sure. Well, during COVID, you didn't have a choice. And so what happened was a comfort with digital marketing as you started to do it and also case studies. I always say it's easier mm-hmm. to sell a case study than an idea. And so even if your brand didn't dive in right away, your competitor did and yeah. you're seeing what they're doing. And now everybody had to rush into the space. And now as things are opening up, fortunately, now you have this comfort and the case studies and the results and a lot of innovation digitally that is also now being added to the live events that we all know and love. Mm-hmm. But to your point, like if you are, if you're a brand watching another brand do something in year one and you treat it as a case study uh, for you to then go do the same thing they did. Uh, well, you don't want to do the same thing. Well, exactly. Like, that's <laughs> what I'm saying is like, when you look at this case study from someone's year one activation, uh, that brand that did that is, is in year two. And so for you to come in in year one to do that, you're already behind the coin. It's almost like you have to evaluate that case study and, and jump into year two with, you know, with those learnings in, in play. Right. And, and cause you're only, you're only ever going to be a year behind that brand again and again, and again, if you continue yeah. to follow in their footsteps, you know what I mean? Well, I think that's some, what's really interesting too about uh, game fuel and Mountain Dew is having this sub brand approach where essentially, I don't know if this is how you guys are doing it, but it would make sense. Mountain Dew is the more legacy brand, right? They're the safer brand. They're the broader brand. And so you have game fuel kind of trailblazing. If they make mistakes, they can pivot maybe a little easier. Or they can recover or, hey, not as much has been invested in game fuel as Mountain Dew if, you know, worse comes to worse and the, the brand goes down. Um, that's interesting that instead of like, number one, instead of putting all your eggs in one basket with your brand, hoping for this first mover advantage that may or may not work. Mm hmm you have developed a sub brand that is really the innovative trailblazer that your legacy brand is learning from and then maximizing those positive learnings. Yeah. I mean, I think that's, that's hopefully the goal, right? Like it, not every brand is fortunate to have a, a seed and grow type of arm type of branch that, that can be that experimental business, you know, business arm of, of it. I mean, e- Think about, I mean, there are, I, there are so many licensing problems that come in with Mountain Dew, right? Like because of how large of a brand sure. that is and how massively distributed it distributed it is. Right. Um, but you know, Game Fuel is U.S. only, right? Like you, there are less licensing issues. There are more creative ways to uh, to do can offerings, creative can design, like uh, you know, just things that things that can involve the community that can engage the community that can that can excite them everybody loves custom exclusive everybody loves customizability and personalization of things like yep. those are things that that a, that a smaller subset like a game fuel can can tackle head on in a much less red tape you know form fitting way than like a, than if a broader mountain do was to come in and try and implement changes and, and, and experimenting with things like that so you know i think that while we are fortunate and not every brand has that opportunity, like we do have to take advantage of it too, though, sure. right? Like we can't just, we can't just say that we have this t- seed and grow brand that, that we're here to have fun with. Um, and then don't move any needles, right? Like we, yeah. we, you know, I think that, um, I would say that I kind of would like if the eyes were on us, right? Like I, I do want Mountain Dew and game field to be that pillar example of how to, of how, uh, of how to approach the space with, you know, with multiple different portfolios. Right. And, um, you know, I think that it would be really exciting if we were, you know, if we were looked at as, as those guys. And, and so, um, you know, that's, 
that's where we're historically we have just been game fueled by the way so i'm not yeah you know this is this i think you know as we are starting to as starting to kind of see the space kind of evolve and and understand that, that there's a chance to kind of grab a bigger piece of this pie than just like this niche esports audience right i think that that is that's going to uh show off on our brand strategy as we as we you know potentially look towards different opportunities for the brands um and so it's super exciting but you know we are building the plane as we fly it right so everybody yeah, you know sure. and that's the that's the glory that's the benefit and the curse right of the esports industry is um you know there aren't that many case studies right there there's only there's only so many things that are you can do right and there's only so many things you can do wrong and unfortunately with the gaming space you don't know if they're right or wrong until until after the fact yeah until you get hit by reddit and twitter and yeah, all exactly, of a sudden you're tw- exactly. you're trending and you're like oh we're trending oh no we're trending which right, happens right. to a lot of brands i do as we have about uh 15 minutes or so left here in the episode um Let's talk about a few brands who are doing it right, you know, because it's it's easy to criticize, but I'd love to, you know, share some of the the brands and I'll go first really quick, but people who've listened to a lot of episodes will know I'm a big fan of what Turtle Wax did with Optic Gaming. And so essentially, uh, you would say, oh, Turtle Wax, Car Wax, what do they do? They sponsor iRacing, whatever. No, they sponsored a Call of Duty team. How does that make any sense? Well, shout out my good friend Dan Ciccone out there and the the Optic team as well. But what they did is they recognized that Crim6 uh, drives a Porsche and is all about his Porsche. And he's a top Call of Duty player, formerly with Optic Gaming. I think he's now with the New York Subliners most recently. But they did all this content with Crim6 with his Porsche, Hex with his G-Wagon, Flamesword with his motorcycle... Uh, a lot of content, for example, Hex has a Great Dane named Henry. And if you've got a Great Dane in a G-Wagon, that thing's got to be cleaned, right? And they also wrapped Krim's Porsche in a, a wrap that was the same design as his scuff controller. And they shipped his Porsche to this these Call of Duty World League uh, tournaments where you could take a picture with the Turtle Wax Porsche. Mm-hmm. And so you got to believe that Every 15-year-old, 16-year-old, how do they see their Honda Civic? That's their Porsche. That's their Mm G-Wagon, right? And so they're playing COD. They're watching content. When they go to AutoZone or O'Reilly's Auto Parts or whatever's down the street, you got to believe they're picking up Turtle Wax. And I know from firsthand experience that that sponsorship resulted in more sales than any other sponsorship within the last 20 years of the company. So you have not only you do something cool, but you did something cool that resulted in sales. And they then they expanded to sponsor Splice as well for a more international play. But um, mm-hmm. I love that. Are there any other ex- uh, brands that you've seen that are doing something right? Um, yeah, for sure. I, I really, I think that uh, the one that, the one that I've seen that's made uh, strides is, is Chipotle. Um, yeah. You know, I think that they started off as, as the, you know, I was, I used to be obsessed with, you know, before I really like really knew what was going on in terms of partnerships. Like I was obsessed with the fact that they would give their talent the Chipotle cards. Right. Um, I thought that was such a huge value. Uh, who doesn't like Chipotle? Those guys are already talking about it every day anyway. Like yeah. what a perfect fit. Um, and, and so I, you know, I, from the outset, I was like always wondering what, how they were going to improve on that. Um, and then they started doing a bunch of like these Chipotle Challenger Series tournaments where mm-hmm. they would, you know, get the community involved and they would activate a dream hack and whatnot. And um, yeah. and those were good. You know, I, I didn't really watch too many on stream. Um, I knew they had a big prize pool. I knew they were great. You know, they had a lot of talent. Uh, but I think that was, you know, I've just been kind of inundated with that tournament model that um, that I was like, okay, cool. Like this is the, it's a it's a must have. Like that is the logical next step in this in this ecosystem is, you know, you, you make a splash and then you start doing tournaments. Like that's just kind yeah. of what, what, what we're seeing is this hamster wheel of, of, of marketing. Um, but what they're doing now is, uh, is I really think it's a great evolution where they're actually, so they partnered with halo, um, and they're doing like basically how, you know, like we do double XP for call of duty, like uh-huh. where you open up a Mountain Dew bottle and you get double XP. Mm-hmm. Um, they're doing it with halo. And cool. instead of getting double XP in halo, 
you're getting like these these challenge resets. So like you you have a certain amount of challenge that you can then swap out for other challenges, and that's right now that's the only way to level up on the battle pass. So like that's cool. if you exhaust your daily challenges, then you really aren't getting that much more experience throughout the day. But if I get these challenge resets from Chipotle, I don't know if they're actually called that. So, but there's something similar. But yeah. you then can plug them in and, and receive additional challenges to continue to level through your battle pass. And um, just thought it was like you know, first off, an in-game integration is 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 the next step in my opinion. Um, I agree, especially what we're seeing with like the metaverse and where this whole world is going in terms of this digital age. So, like the integration into the game is, is fantastic. I think it really ties perfectly close and lo- closely aligned you're also rewarding the gamers with things that the gamers want um yeah. you know you're we we face a, a hurdle with the giving away of these double xp codes from a mountain dew standpoint because you know double xp is great for vanguard and for Warzone, but you know for only like probably the first couple months you know like sure. um where you know what what unique integrations what unique rewarding mechanisms what can we do with our you know, developer partners to enhance and create and reward in game. That is, that is something that, that, that can be taken advantage of instead of just during the COD launch, right? Like yeah. how can something be valuable to somebody in Q2 and Q3 that, that we kind of don't have these peaks and valleys of big splashes and then, and then we fade away into existence. Right. And so I think that, uh, that that Chipotle deal that was was really smart and you know super pumped to see kind of what else they have working on uh, and for next year. Yeah, I think that's great. And you know, we we're earlier in the episode saying, you know, what are some answers? I think one of those answers is that you know that in-game integration and being able to tie a physical product with with the game, but not in the way I think historically, you know, brands are always looking to get give people a reason to. Oh, if you to to go back towards their product, and mm-hmm. if you give people rather a reason to go back towards the game, I think that's much more popular because you have to you have to essentially kind of even take your brand out of the whole equation and saying what do what does the community want, right? They want a better yeah. experience playing the game. They want fun experiences. They want to be able to compete. Uh, they want great content. All of these things, and if you essentially can be the solution for those things that they want, then that is your opportunity. And your homework is figuring out which solution and how it's executed is consistent with your brand. So when I hear about it, I'm like, like turtle wax or what you said with Chipotle, it's like, yeah, that sounds about right. That makes sense. I think it's also establishing that fine line between uh, between what you interpret as supporting and versus exploiting, right? Good point. Um, and, you know, I think that, and I, I, I keep dreaming about this. I love what COVID has allowed this digital evolution of, of free trials. And I say that from, um, like, when everybody asks me, like, what do gamers want? Like, the first thing that comes to my head, because I am a gamer and it's what I want, so maybe it's just me being selfish, but, like, it's gameplay. It's exclusive gameplay. Like, mm. I want... I like if 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 a brand can give me access to a game before it's released, then I will look at that brand as champions, right? Like um, we have uh, a perfect example was a game called Riders Republic, which is a Ubisoft game. Yeah, um, they did a they they did a free trial for everybody. It was during it, was, it lasted four days, I think, but the trial itself was a four hour demo. So mm. when I booted up this game and I hit the start button, then there's a four hour timer that's in the top right corner. And once that four hours goes away, I no longer have access to that demo. Wow. Imagine tying codes to that, right? So like I go and buy a Mountain Dew bottle and I, and I pop the top and I get four hours of Call of Duty, of the new Call of Duty a month before it comes out. Right. But it's only four hours. So then I got to go buy a bunch more, call, a bunch more Mountain Dews so that I can get more yeah. gameplay. Are we are we are we exploiting our audience there? You know what I mean. And you like, got to be real careful, right? Because it's yeah. it's. I mean, perception is reality, so it's how they feel about it. And right, that's where you have to. You're you're saying exactly perfectly, but is you can't fall too in love with your own KPIs. Mm-hmm. Right. Right. I'm trying to sell. It's like, does the community care about your sales? Spoiler alert: they don't. No. 
But what they, well, so what do they do care they about, care? and how are you empowering, enabling that behavior? I, I think, I think the the way to get the other unique model that is that can come off as exploitative as well, if done wrong, like you said, like they're a good. What did you say the other day? A good idea, a good plan executed poorly is a bad idea. Yeah. Um, and and I think that the one. I think the, uh, a ticket for success, especially from like a product company, a company that has a good for sale, like like a like a game fuel can or or like a like a scuff controller. Mm-hmm. Um, finding ways to tie in player equity is mm. so I think is so huge in terms of like an authentic incentivization for that talent. Yep. Like right now, we have deliverables stacked in where they have to have the game fuel on screen, right? They have to have the overlay up for a promotion, right? And they and and you know they just have to do it because that's part of what their sponsorship a lot like that's what it's in the agreement. Um, yeah. But what if these players were getting got it got a got a slice of every can they sold on stream? Like now we don't even have to bake in these deliverables that they have to feature this, they have to feature that because. If they want to make money, then they're going to step up to the plate and they're going to endorse this product, right? And uh, where's the fine line between exploiting? But like, what if these guys turn into these money hungry dudes that are only pushing game fuel all day long, and now it starts to overtake their, you know, the value of their actual stream? And that's because we did that, right? Now all of a sudden, I feel like I did something wrong, and so um, that fine line is is interesting to flirt with too. So I think it's it's all fascinating. Well, it's interesting because that's kind of what's happened with influencer marketing. The reason influencer marketing started in the first place is people were like, wow, when Kim Kardashian posted that she's drinking this Pepsi organically, look how many impressions we got, right? And then they're like, what if we sent Kim Kardashian Pepsi, right? And then people just very quickly through social media realized to the point that now you have to push put hashtag ad (laughs) on your that. And then it loses the reason that you went to it in the first place. And so right. you got to go and do something else, a deeper integration, right? Well, it's and tough so. because everybody wants like the most, like every, like, we've learned through, through practice and through marketing that the number one way to sell a product is through endorsement of the celebrity or the fan that that viewer likes. Right. Yeah. So like, John, if I'm obsessed with your podcast, I'm obsessed with what you do, and I tune in every single day, then then if I'm a brand, I'm going to have you talk about my product Correct. on a podcast, right? right. And when <laughs> I could drink some game fuel, baby, you know, send it yeah, over, right. send the yeah, contract. Yeah. No, no. I, <laughs> I think what what what, I, what frustrates me though is what is what's happened to that that marketing. Um, I mean, we all listen to a lot of podcasts. Like, I skip the ad reads. Like, of course. I, I I dig into my like I know that you know Tom Segura's podcast they do the first eleven minutes is all ads I know that I know I know how long their ad reads are because I I'm so trained to hit play and fast forward yep. through all of the through all of it um, but the double edged sword is the reason why they're getting so many of this stuff is because they must be working like they must be driving sales they must be converting because it hasn't it hasn't we haven't evolved from that yet. Yeah. Um, but what is the next step in the ad read? Like, how can you make it more engaging? How can you make it more enjoyable? Because I think we're going to get burnout if we're not already burnout. But uh, the ad reads are going to be that, that that can't last forever. I hope to well, God that we're smart enough as an industry to not let that be where we hang our hat in terms of peak advertising. You know what I mean? Like 100%. that. It can't be ad reads, dude. Like we we're too uh, we're we're too smart for that stuff. But whatever yeah and i think part of it too is just like as i've you know looked at you know i'm now focusing on you know getting sponsors for the podcast and like you know how can Mm -hmm. i take this to the next level and i've thought what would make sense for me right and some natural things are maybe i i wear a hat all the time i could easily approach hat companies be like oh yeah john's sponsored by xyz of course he is that dude's always wearing hats i'm wearing headphones on the podcast right? I've got an Apple computer. Call me Dell. You know, (laughs) these are these things where it's like, when you dig into what is natural to the person, this is why turtle wax worked well. If Crim6, Flamesword and Hex weren't really into their cars, it wouldn't have worked. The reason it worked Mm -hmm. is because they were into their cars and they simply 
organically, authentically fit into what they were doing naturally and that their yeah. community knew that they did. Hector didn't go buy a G-Wagon and a Great Dane, so then he would have to clean a car with this product. Right. That dog was already mudding up his you know, expensive car. Yep. And now somebody just paid him to say, hey, I know you need to clean that car. What if you did it with my product? And right. that that's where those things work a lot better. And they and it comes it all comes full circle back to what we said earlier, right? Like they did that because they spent a little bit of time learning uh, about the pain points. Like that's they right. they didn't just they didn't just come in and assume, like you know, uh, that they knew what was up. Um, now they might have had a gamer on the inside that was like, hey, these guys, like you know, they might have been per- they might have perceived it, you know, well enough to to just jump in and make it look like it was a seamless play. But you know, there is. There, there was research that was most likely done, or there was already a there was already a relationship in place that made it a no brainer, right? Like it, this yep. didn't just you can't do that same turtle wax deal with phase or with hundred thieves. Like right. now, maybe you could, and maybe I just used the only two examples. Like, <laughs> I think use the two that you could, <laughs> but your points well taken. You know what I mean? Like, yeah, this is what I will you say. Can't replicate it all. Yeah, one of my favorite quotes is that the script for the influencer is an oxymoron, right? So if you are looking at what would be natural for an influencer or a team or a league, et cetera, go to them and ask. Yeah. I was on a round table. I, I did a private round table. It's one of my like coolest experiences of COVID. I was on a private round table co-hosting with Gary Vaynerchuk. And we brought a bunch of these amazing people. We brought Sundance, uh, Nate Ekman from All, Chris Puckett, just this sure. amazing group of people um, to have this conversation. And I said to Gary, I said, Gary, from what I, my experience is, if you go to the community and you ask them what they want, they'll tell you, why don't people do this? And he said, John, about 2% of CEOs, you know, and top tier professional business people will do this. They just think that they know and they're not willing to listen. Yeah, right. So take a dose of humility, ask the community, they'll tell you what they want. Vinny, I know you that you need to head out here uh, in a minute or two, so... I wish I didn't, but yeah, unfortunately I do. Hey, this is the result of our lives. You're a busy guy. You are pulled in many directions for for many reasons. Everybody's trying to get a hold of you. So why don't you tell people how to get a hold of you? Where should they follow you in the ways that you'd like them to? Oh, man. Um... I just, I'm, I'm on Twitter and Instagram. Uh, I don't do much. I usually just retweet a bunch of stuff on Twitter and post a few stories on Instagram. But uh, those are the two main platforms that I use. And I'm Vinted Shello, So it's basically my first and last name combined. So uh, you find me anywhere. I think that's also my Xbox gamer tag and my Steam profile and my, I don't know. It's kind of where I live everywhere. So nice. Um, yeah, Brand it's, consistency. it's pretty simple, and yeah, I really appreciate the time here, John. And um, this has been great. I, I hope that this isn't the last combo that we have um, on. Uh, we're gonna have plenty more over the phone, but I yeah. think we need to get in person and, and make this happen here, legit here, sometime soon. Because this was a blast. We absolutely do. There's a lot more to talk to you about. So thank you, Vinny Minicello, for joining me today on the DLC Drop Podcast. Thank you for listening to the DLC Drop Podcast. This podcast is part of the Esports Future Eye Podcast Network and produced by Innovation Media Enterprises. Make sure you subscribe on your favorite podcast channel and leave us a review.